Greetings from National Academy of Medical Sciences, India. Focusing on NAMS Vision 2030, NAMS is pleased to share some of the important activities like NAMS National, International Fellowship and Membership, Member After Day and Beam NAMS, NAMS Task Forces, AIMS NAMS Navigate, Navigate Medico CME, CME Activities, Publication of Annals, Newsletter, Networking with Professionals, Public Orations, Young Scientist Fellowship, Scientist Exchange Program, Scientific Visit of Emeritus Professor and many more activities. All application forms for Fellowship, Membership, Associate Fellowship, and Member After Day NB have been made online and objective criteria from the year 2022. AMS has also started a new online AMS NAMS Navigate CME and Navigate Medico CME program to assist in the development of competencies among PG students and share multimedia learning resource materials as e-library. NAMS has also started 21 task forces to address medical issues of national importance. Under publication activities, NAMS has its own annual as Annal of the National Academy of Medical Sciences. In addition, NAMS also publishes its quarterly NAMS newsletter. For more details of NAMS activities please visit our NAMS website www.nams-india.in or scan QR codes with the camera app. Greetings from National Academy of Medical Sciences, India. NAMS has been recognized by the Government of India as a nodal agency for promoting the continuing medical education for medical and biomedical professionals. National Academy of Medical Sciences encourages and sponsors nationwide CME programs, symposia and workshops in medical and biomedical professionals. NAMS is pleased to announce the launching of a joint AIMS NAMS Navigate CME program from 1st September 2023 for postgraduate students in all the AIIMS and other eminent institutes of national importance from Andhra Pradesh, Arunachal Pradesh, Assam, Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Goa, Gujarat, Haryana, Himachal Pradesh, Jammu and Kashmir, Jharkhand, Karnataka, Kerala, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, Manipur, Meghalaya, Mizoram, Nagaland, Odisha, Punjab, Rajasthan, Sikkim, Tamil Nadu, Telangana, Tripura, Uttar Pradesh and Uttarakhand of the country. The program is being conducted online on the first Friday of every month from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. The AIM is Nam CME which are of common interest for the postgraduates across all specialties. The aim of the National Virtual Postgraduate Medical CME is to help them to be more proficient in their profession. Each session will cover two topics. Each topic will be of one hour duration, which includes 45 minutes for presentation by speaker, 15 minutes for questions and answers. Thank you for your kind support. Good afternoon, one and all. I welcome you all to today's Navigate Medico CME program. I would now like to invite Professor Umesh Kapil, sir, the Secretary of the National Academy of Medical Sciences, to deliver the welcome address. Uh, namaskar and uh, good afternoon to all of you. It's a proud privilege to welcome on behalf of National Academy of Medical Sciences. Today we have a very, very important uh, session and which everybody needs to be aware about it while they are practicing in the hospital or at any other clinical establishment. 
we have today two eminent uh, scientists who are the senior faculty members, professors at All India Institute of Medical in Delhi, who have been contributing a lot in the field of uh, hospital infections, also taking care of the patients in the clinical practice. We have with us Dr. Uh, Gagandeep Singh, who is a professor in the Department of Microbiology, and he has been outstanding. During the COVID, he was the one who was, who was responsible for developing COVID guidelines, which were of all industry of medical sciences, which were followed up all over the country. His main area is healthcare associated infections, which is a main thrust area of Dr. Gagandeep Ji. He had uh, many publications and awards, which Dr. Piti would be talking about and mentioning it when, he, when she is introducing Dr. Gagandeep. Another important uh, uh, session we are going to have is from Dr. Uh, Rakesh Lodha, who has grown tremendously in his field. He was a MBA student. Now he has become a very, very senior professor, an outstanding clinician. And we mainly talking about patient safety protocols because he is the one who is responsible for developing all the patient safety protocols at all industries of medical sciences in Delhi. Also, if you look at Dr. Rakesh Loda, we'll be discussing the clinical issues, the clinical uh, cases, the small epidemics which happen in uh, Deku, the neonatal uh, units, and he would be giving the practical examples how to deal with uh, how he is it and how it can be further taken care of. Uh, these are the few comments. With these, I would like to say that please listen to them, get benefited, and thank you very much, Dr. Preeti, uh, with the Assistant Professor in the Department of Psychiatry, who has been helping this AIMS, NAMS, navigate with it. With these few words, I take again my thanks to you. Over to you, Dr. Preeti. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to in, uh, request our IT team uh, personnel, uh, Mr. Anil, to display the video from our Honorable Director, Mrs. Srinivas Sir, who is the Director of All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, and who has been a great support for this Navigate Medical CME program. Namaskar. At the outset, I congratulate the team behind the NAMS AIMS Navigate CME program. Providing quality of education to our postgraduate students is one of the prime responsibilities of AIMS. I know that our able faculty is leaving no stone unturned in achieving this mission. However, there always remains a scope for improvement. Through this unique initiative, there is an opportunity for our postgraduate students to learn from the experts in their field. This learning will go beyond the boundaries of the department where our postgraduate students are working and will also bring in more flavor in their knowledge and at the same time ensure dissemination of uniform, high quality content all across the nation. Postgraduate students also form our primary workforce for providing patient care. This indeed is an important component of their training. We are aware that our postgraduate students devote a large component of their time for the patient care services and thus they have less time for self-study by the end of the day. The timing of this activity is therefore very carefully chosen. 
The sessions will be held late in the afternoon so that the beneficiaries do not have to make any extra effort for attending them. This by itself exudes the philosophy of a true teacher, a mentor that will handhold the children through the process of their active learning. As the sessions are online, which by its very design is a non-synchronous platform, it may seem that the delivery of the content will be one-sided, but enough measures have been planned and they are in place to make the activity as interactive as possible. The topic of the session will be shared with the students well in advance. This will allow them enough time to explore the subject and, and be better prepared to absorb the content. This design, therefore, also matches the concept and principles of adult learning. The program not only will help our postgraduate students in being better prepared for their examinations, but also will equip them with sufficient knowledge, understanding and approach to be a better professional in their field. I wish this program all success. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to invite the speaker for the first session, Professor Gagandeep sir, who is an additional professor at the Microbiology and Hospital Infection Control at the Department of Microbiology, Ames, New Delhi. His research interest includes healthcare associated infections, antifungal stewardship, candida auris, therapeutic drug monitoring of antifungal agents, and histoplas uh, histoplasmosis epidemiology and diagnosis. He has a, a large number of publications, around 128 publications to his credit, and he has also written 10 chapters in books and has edited one book. It's a honor and a privilege for us to have you with us here, sir, to deliver the topic on, uh, to deliver the speech on the topic, hospital acquired infections and management of waste in wards. Thank you for accepting the invitation, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. So I'll just share my screen. So are the slides visible? Yes, sir. All right. So uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, NAMS for giving me this opportunity to talk on an extremely important topic relevant to all postgraduates, whether working in the clinical or the paraclinical areas or the non-clinical areas. And um, I'll be discussing in detail um, healthcare associated infections, which were also known as hospital acquired infections and management of waste in the wards, which is also known as bio and medical waste management. So these are my disclosures. And uh, I'll be discussing the burden of the disease, transmission and types, and various uh, prevention strategies. And uh, some being uh, standard precautions, transmission-based precautions, and the approaches which are specific to device-associated infections. And finally, I'll be covering the biomedical waste management in the clinical areas. and. Uh, just to put things into perspective, I'll be, uh, as we go along, I'll be discussing a few case studies. So, uh, what, how do we define healthcare associated infections? So, these are infections uh, which occur in a patient during the process of care in a hospital or other healthcare facilities, but it was not present or incubating at the time of admission. And majority of the healthcare associated acute bacterial they occur after 48 hours or two calendar days of admission and infections acquired in the hospital, but not evident until after discharge are also considered as HIV because they may be, they may have been acquired on the last day or maybe, uh, you know, second last day of admission. And then once the patient is discharged, the patient may then present after being discharged. So even those have to be considered as healthcare associated infection. And it is very important to uh, remember that healthcare associated infections uh, they include occupational infections among healthcare providers as well. So it is not only the patient uh, who is getting the infection, it is also the healthcare provider who are at equal risk. So, so I, if I talk about the burden of disease, so it is a major problem for patient safety and details of patient safety are going to be discussed by the next speaker. And surveillance and prevention are extremely important and should be the priority of any institution who are committed to make healthcare safer for the patients. And overall, you know, the WHO estimates that around 1.4 million patients worldwide in developed and developing countries are affected by healthcare associated infections at any given time. 
checked the um, you know statistics in developed countries uh, 5 to 15% of overall of the hospitalized patients may have healthcare associated infections and which may range from 9 to 37% uh, for those who are admitted in the icus uh, even uh, in the developed world you know this been, there's been a recent report from europe where the uh, infection rate acquired in the hospital uh, ranged from around 5 to 10% and this uh, can be much higher in developing countries uh, which may be as high as 30% but the actual data is really lacking because nobody is you know to get a true perspective and a true uh, indication of how much infection is being acquired in the hospitals is actually uh, not, not, not. If you look at the impact of healthcare associated infections, these can be uh, prolonged hospital stay because the patient then has to be treated for the infection additionally. It may cause massive additional financial burden both to the hospital and to the patient. It may cause long term disability. And of course, because we are giving the patient more antibiotics, the patient, the bugs are exposed to higher uh, or newer generations of antibiotics, thereby increasing the resistance to uh, the antimicrobials. And of course, it can increase the mortality as well. And if the overall cost, we were just talking about the cost, you know, it, it runs into billions and uh, cost per case, if you look at the central line associated bloodstream infections are the most costly ultimately per case, uh, followed by the ventilator associated pneumonia and so on and so forth. So this uh, figure is extremely important for everyone to understand because if you understand the chain of infection, you would be uh, you would be able to break the chain easily. So we start with the agent, which are usually which can be most often they are bacteria, but they can be fungi, they can be viruses, parasites, prions, uh, most of these, you know, and they can be uh, dual infections as well. The reservoir uh, here is the infected patient who has the infection uh, at any site. Portal of exit is any excretion or secretion from the patient carrying the multidrug resistant organisms. Mode of transmission is how uh, from the reservoir the infection is being transmitted to the susceptible host and I'll be talking much more about modes of transmission because this is the part where you know the intervention is most effective and susceptible host all of our hospitals are full of susceptible hosts be it elderly uh, small children patients on cancer chemotherapy diabetics and so on and so forth the list is so long so uh, there's no dearth of susceptible host and then, of course, portal of entry, mostly, you know, depending upon uh, the mode of transmission, it can be through mucosal surfaces, through the respiratory route, through the, you know, percutaneous injuries. And this is what completes the chain of infection. And I'll come to the most important component, which are the modes of transmission and important to understand uh, by all of us. So first, almost are the contact transmissions. So these are infections which are spread uh, through touch or via contact with blood and body fluids or secretions and this can further be classified as two types one is the direct transmission where the infectious agents are transferred uh, from one person to the another example uh, the patient's blood entering a healthcare worker's body through an unprotected cut or skin during surgery would be a direct transmission then the other and the more important one is the indirect transmission where the infectious agent is transmitted through contaminated intermediate objects or person and most important example of this is the healthcare workers hands and so if, if anybody asks you which is the most important mode of transmission which is actually the indirect transmission which is like and the most important healthcare workers hands and if i give you examples of infections which are spread through contact transmission they are the multi-drug resistant organisms like MRSA, carbapenem resistant enterobacterials uh, and uh, Clostridioides difficile, norovirus, all of these are spread through uh, contact. If you look at the second uh, type of uh, transmission, it is droplet transmission and droplets are transmitted or they are produced when an infected patient coughs, sneezes or talks. And mostly, if you uh, uh, look at the microstructure, they are larger than 5 micron in size and they contain a lot of 
you know the moisture content is uh, there so that is why what that is what makes the particle size larger and because of the larger size they are heavier and therefore they don't uh, travel uh, much further generally we say that droplets don't go beyond 2 meters and uh, droplets can also be transmitted indirectly if uh, you know the, they fall directly onto the mucosal surfaces like nose mouth eyes etc and majority of the respiratory tract infections are uh, transmitted in the form of droplets uh, few important examples being the influenza virus bordetella pertussis meningococcus etc third and uh, the most uh, dangerous uh, type can be the airborne transmission and this is usually through smaller particles which are also known as droplet nuclei and these actually are dried uh, particles dust particles on which uh, the organism is there and therefore because of their smaller size they can travel further on and they can re remain suspended in the air for uh, hours together making them extremely dangerous even in, if an infected patient has moved out the airborne uh, you know the small particles of infect the other person coming into that room and they are uh, important procedures which generally or routinely are done in hospitals like uh, you know sputum induction bronchoscopy airway suctioning endotracheal intubation all of these can produce uh, you know these droplet nuclei and important agents which are uh, known uh, to be transmitted through this uh, transmission or uh, the this type of transmission the airborne transmission are the measles virus the chickenpox and again most mycobacterium tuberculosis so now coming to having spoken about the basic definition of healthcare associated infections and the uh, the chain of infection and modes of transmission now i'll be covering the different uh, types of uh, healthcare associated infections and i'll be covering the important types here namely the urinary tract infection bloodstream infections pneumonia surgical site infection and the gastrointestinal infection if you look at the distribution it it really depends or varies from country to country or from hospital to hospital even uh, different units within a main you know within one hospital may or may one department may have uh, you know different distribution or different uh, uh, healthcare associated infection based upon their practices based upon the kind of patients that they are uh, seeing so uh, coming to the most commonly encountered uh, hai which is the urinary tract infections and they can account for around one third to almost half of the patients of healthcare associated infections and important risk factors for acquiring urinary tract infections are uh, indwelling urinary catheter instrumentation uh, instrumentation of the urinary tract poor aseptic uh, preparation during catheter poor catheter maintenance advancing age and severe underlying illnesses all can predispose however underlying urinary catheter definitely is the most important if you look at the organisms you know they can there's a whole uh, list common ones being e coli klebsiella proteus etc and this the epidemiology you know it varies from hospital to hospital and if you generally also look at this list these are the ones which cause the blood stream infection uh, the pneumonias the sk uh, skin and soft tissue infection most of the multi drug resistant bugs are multifaceted and they can cause any type of healthcare associated infection the number type of uh, hai are the healthcare associated blood stream infection and these can be serious with up to 50% uh, mortality and these are most often associated with in intravascular catheters and uh, you know whether a patient ultimately acquires blood stream infections or not totally depends upon how the uh, intravascular catheter has been inserted how the healthcare workers are handling it and duration for which the catheters are in place because it is said that the longer the catheter is there the more prone the patient is to a blood stream infection and it is not only the central line um, which can cause uh, these infections even peripheral will be a source of infection uh, as we know common organisms almost remain the same third type are the healthcare associated pneumonias and again this is this can be very serious and ventilator you know ventilator uh, um, patients on ventilators are supposed to be uh, maximally at risk 
and uh, there are two types of um, you know events or definitions which we use generally in uh, uh, hic one is the ventilator associated uh, event and the other is ventilator associated pneumonia pneumonia actually occupies a very small place uh, there because clinical pneumonia is uh, may occur very rarely however there are other events which the uh, patient may uh, experience while being on a ventilator like fluid overload ards atelectasis pulmonary embolism aspiration pneumonia so on and so forth so that is why the cdc uh, over a period of time observed that it is not only the pneumonia which is important there are so many other events related to ventilation uh, that uh, should also be considered uh, you know while uh, calculating the rates if you look at the risk factors as i told you the invasive devices bypassing natural defenses as in mechanical ventilation intubation etc are the most important existing pulmonary and neurological diseases are important because the patient should to uh, you know clear the respiratory secretions and uh, you know any pooling of secretions predisposes the patient to uh, infections medications such as broad spectrum antibiotics antacids immunosuppressive agents and chemotherapy all can predispose to uh, these infections extremes of age and major surgery are also contributing if we look at uh, the um, epidemiology the, the causes this again can vary generally nowadays multi drug resistant acinetobacter pseudomonas klebsiella etc are the common agents uh, causing vapo va then uh, coming to surgical site in accidents of surgical site infections can vary from uh, 0.5 to up to 15% and this totally depends upon the type of uh, the surgery that the patient is undergoing underlying status of the patient extent of contamination during the procedure the site of surgery and the length of operation common agents being staphylococcus aureus e coli klebsiella pseudomonas etc and the fifth type uh, uh, that i'll be discussing are the gastrointestinal infection although there are many infections like uh, salmonella e coli which cause infection the most important here are the infections uh, caused by clostridioides difficile which we also known as uh, the antibiotic associated diarrhea they are commoner in pediatric wards and they can be acquired from infected patients infected healthcare workers etc and they spread through contaminated environment through toilets and inadequate hand washing so uh, till now i have discussed the definition the basic epidemiology the different types but the focus of today's talk is how to prevent uh, these infections so these can uh, be classified under three subheadings one are the standard precautions number two are the transmission based precautions and the three third one is the bundle approach for specific hgi precautions are to be observed or are to be followed every single time uh, you know you deal with the patient whereas you know and standard precautions are irrespective of the infectious uh, status of the patient whereas transmission based precautions are when once you know that the patient is already infected with uh you know one of the um, important organisms so there you uh, bring in place in addition to the standard precautions the transmission based precautions are to be followed uh, and this is important to remember so uh, what exactly are standard precautions so these are a set of infection control practices that healthcare personnel use to reduce transmission of microorganisms in healthcare setting like both the healthcare worker as well as the patient from contact with the infectious agent and as i told you this is irrespective of the infection status you will always follow standard precautions whenever you are dealing with the patient so these are the various components as enlisted by the uh, centers for disease control and prevention uh, usa and the most important component being hand hygiene followed by uh, appropriate use of personal protective equipment environmental cleaning and disinfection minimizing potential exposure in which respiratory hygiene is the most important injection and medication uh, or uh, medication safety and finally reprocessing of reusable medical equipment and i'll be discussing all of these in more detail i'm sure most of you are well aware of uh, these two posters and uh, i won't be going into the details the most important thing that i'd like to highlight here is there are uh, you know practically what we've seen 
that uh, you know deficiencies especially if you are if you talk about uh, alcohol based hand rub uh, so deficiency in the procedure are in uh, from the very beginning from taking inadequate amount of the alcohol to not performing all the six steps uh, so these are routinely observed uh you know deficiencies so uh, while comparing um, hand wash and hand rub we know that you know the the using soap and water requires uh, a little more time because you have to form you know wet your hands form lather and then do the steps whereas in alcohol you can drink so therefore alcohol based hand rubs uh, you know they just take 20 to 30 seconds whereas if, if you're doing hand hygiene using soap and water it takes around 40 seconds to uh one minute and one more important thing to remember is that the sequence of how you do those six steps really doesn't matter ultimately you need to perform all the six steps uh for sure so that will uh, make sure that all the uh, you know parts which are generally uh, ignored while performing hand hygiene are covered these are the who's five moments of hand hygiene opportunities basically you know how to do hand hygiene but when to do it or what are the opportunities when hand hygiene should be done has been defined by the uh, world health organization and it says that it should always be done before touching a patient before any clean or aseptic procedure after coming in contact uh, with the uh, body fluid of a patient after touching a patient or after even after touching the patient's surroundings so these are all opportunities whenever you face an uh, you know situation you must do it it's not necessary that every time you will be doing face this situation you should perform hand hygiene and to you know uh, make it more clear i have a case study here so here you can see there was a resident who visits a patient's room to perform a bedside examination he opens the door stands in front of the patient's bed leaning on the bed rails he asks the patient if he feels pain and examines the abdomen after completing the clinical examination he washes his hands in the sink with soap and water he makes note in the patient's chart and then leaves the room so just to maybe you know you can uh, think what the answer should be so the quest first question is uh, was the doctor compliant with hand hygiene practice and which of the who's five moments of hand hygiene did he miss and was the soap and water the most appropriate method for hand hygiene so was he compliant no he he missed several opportunities so which of the opportunities did he miss he failed to perform hand hygiene before touching the patient and also after contact with the patient so after he made notes in the patient chart he again should have performed hand hygiene so before he touched the patient he should have performed hand hygiene after examining the patient he should have performed hand hygiene and then after writing notes in the patient patient's chart again hand hygiene should have so was soap and water the most appropriate method of hand hygiene no so the cdc says that the most effective method is actually alcohol hand uh, based hand rub because it is uh, you know uh, it's the compliance is much higher it is better for your skin and washing with soap and water is only indicated when the hands are visibly soiled contaminated or dirty next i'll be talking about uh, you know usage of pp and that is you know one basic thing to remember by anybody using pp is that you yourself have have to do the risk assessment how much do you think will be the exposure and what type of exposure are you expecting while performing any uh, procedure so that determines what uh, different type of pp should be worn one more you know the misuse of the term pp that pp is the entire set you know the the gown the respirator goggles gloves uh, head cover shoe cover so it's you know that that should your usage of the term should change because every component is pp so if i'm only wearing a mask i'm that is i'm wearing a pp if i'm only wearing gloves i'm wearing a pp so stop using the term pp being you know the entire set from head to toe so uh, coming to the sequence of donning uh, so gowns are generally worn first followed by the mask or the respirator goggles and gloves because uh, you know gloves are mostly the most sterile part of the pp that are you know uh, generally worn 
so that is uh, why gloves are usually worn the uh, at the last if we talk about the sequence of doffing so uh, because the gloves are the most contaminated so therefore gloves need to be removed but you know cdc has given out uh, different uh, doffing protocol so depending upon the most contaminated of uh, the you know type of pp that you're wearing that should come off first so if you have had a you know splash of blood on your face shield so you have to remove that first so generally but gloves a face shield or goggles gowns and ultimately mask or respirator and generally mask and respirator is removed after you come away from uh, the patient mostly in the ante room or just after come exiting the patient room so that is what is to be done and always before and after uh, use of the pp or uh, types of pp you must perform hand hygiene cough etiquettes again are very important to prevent uh, acquisition of infection so you should cover your mouth and nose with a tissue paper uh, while coughing and sneezing if you don't have that so you you can you know cough or sneeze in your elbow uh, and if the risk uh, or the exposure is high you may wear a triple layer mask or a n95 mask and definitely hand hygiene is again a very important part of cough etiquettes as well uh another part of the standard precaution are the injection and medication safety again uh, a lot of the times we get residents with needle stick injuries and because they fail to follow simple rules uh, which are that no recapping should ever be done yeah, you know whenever you using a needle and syringe if at all required you know you have you know you you've given part of the medication and part you want to save for always use the scoop method by which you just put the needle into the cap and then you just uh, put it on to prevent needle stick injuries nowadays even in india you know we have a lot of safety engineered devices or the self disabling uh, syringes they are known as so as soon as you have uh, you know performed the procedure or given the medication you know, they either the needle it uh, itself goes inside the syringe or they have plastic covers which will cover the uh, the sharp end so these ideally should be used whenever uh, you know possible and uh, again uh, when you go to the patient always remember that use a new needle and new syringe every time medication vial or an iv bag is accessed and every time uh, injection is given to a client so this also you know uh, the cdc and who combined have a campaign known as one and only campaign where they say one needle one syringe for one time will definitely lead to zero infections it's elementary it's so easy to understand that if you follow this there will never be infection and again uh, we uh, you know sort of reiterate this very often that, that to single dose wise vials as far as possible because that will again uh, you know lead to you know non transfer of infection sometimes especially in pediatrics we do need to use multi dose vials but try and use that multi dose vial for the same patient uh, as far as possible so uh, this is another case so a nurse giving an injection to an icu patient from a multi dose vial pricked uh, while recapping the needle and she washes the blood off Uh, uh with soap and water and she immediately tries to find out the patient's hiv and hepatitis b and c status so questions here are why is it essential to know the patient's uh, hiv and hepatitis uh, status and what precautions should the nurse have taken to avoid this incident we all know that uh, you know these three infections are the most important uh, uh, blood borne pathogens uh, and so therefore uh, you know needle stick injuries lead to a lot of uh, anxiety so most of the time the healthcare worker would like to find out whether the patient you know what is the status of the patient and um, if the patient has been screened recently and all of them are negative so the healthcare worker is at ease so what precautions have taken to avoid the incident definitely as i said uh, used needles should not be recapped they should be immediately disposed of in a puncture proof sharp box located within arms reach of the procedure and this should always be followed how do you manage you know because we are talking about needle stick injuries so do not squeeze scrub or suck the wound which is you know naturally that's a tendency that we try and suck the wound please don't do that do not clean with alcohol 
and encourage the wound to bleed by holding it under running water. Wash the wound with plenty of soap. Dress the wound, and then uh, you know, uh, in every hospital, uh, you know, there is a designated person, uh, maybe the chief medical officer or any other uh, person who can be contacted immediately, so that the uh, the healthcare worker as well as the source. If known, can be evaluated, and if any uh, post-exposure prophylaxis is to be given, that can be uh, immediately started. And also, there are a number of investigations which need to be done, so those can be done. Now, so till now, I have talked about uh, uh, using standard precautions. So now, I'll be moving on to transmission-based precautions. So these apply to select patients based on suspect or confirmed clinical syndrome, a specific diagnosis or colonization or infection due to epidemiologically important organisms. Putting it simply that if you know that a patient in your ward is infected with a multi-drug resistant organism, has clostridioides, difficile diarrhea, so and other infections, so you take additional precautions in addition to the uh, standard precautions. So these are three major types, of, you know, the modes of transmission that we had already spoken about. So, first and foremost, and the most important one are the airborne precautions. So, an important part is, you know, perform hand hygiene. And this, uh, if you remember, airborne precautions are to be followed if whenever you have a patient of, of mycobacterium tuberculosis and uh, measles and varicella zoster. So, these patients should be placed in a private room. And uh, if possible, there should be negative air pressure. All individuals entering the room should wear N95 mask. And the patient, the infected patient should, you know, limit their movement. They should not be allowed to go in and out of the um, ward. And patient should wear a mask as source control and observe cough etiquette so that, you know, the spread is minimal. Next, we talk about droplet precautions. Again, hand hygiene is an, a very important part of the droplet precautions. Patients require isolation in private room, but not in negative pressure room. So they, they can simply be put in a room or a cubicle and uh, uh, negative pressure is not required because you know that droplets don't travel fast. They just simply settle down. And individuals entering into the room should wear a surgical mask. I think COVID has taught us this clearly that droplet infections can easily be prevented if you wear a surgical mask or medical mask or it is also known as a triple layer mask. And limit movement of the patient again because you don't want again the infectious patient to be moving around the hospital so that uh, needs to be done so uh, lastly we have contact precautions and these are to be followed whenever you know you have a patient uh, with multi drug resistant uh, infections like acinetobacter e coli klebsiella they have surgical wounds so those or even urinary tract infection. So, uh, you know, it's preferable to place patients in private rooms. Healthcare workers should don both gowns and gloves, which is the most important, uh, are the most important PPE to be uh, used when contact precautions are being put in place. Gowns and gloves, because they are infected, so they should be removed before exiting the room and hand hygiene should also be performed again. So again, to put things into perspective, so there was a 45-year-old woman admitted to a hospital with 40% burns wounds to her body, and she requires admission to ICU for ventilation uh, and has a central line and the urinary catheter was also inserted. Uh, the wound cultures, uh, uh, you know, uh, they were reported as having grown Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Acinetobacter, and she had undertaken multiple courses of broad spectrum antibiotics now uh, after many days of admission the microbiology laboratory calls you to inform that again she has you know a grown antibiotic resistant klebsiella pneumonia from her urine so what do you do so um, how will you establish if this organism is colonizing or infecting and i'll come to it why is that important when considering infection uh, transmission doesn't matter if the organism represents colonization or infection and how would you handle a situation uh, infection what do you establish we all know that you know just growing organism might not be uh, the only criteria so we need to look into clinical and laboratory criteria uh, to label the patient as having catheter associated uti 
But if you look at, uh, you know, the concepts related to infection prevention and control, uh, it's, it's, you know, the risk of transmission can be as high um, even in a colonized patient. So it really doesn't matter. Even if you're, you know, uh, if you're not treating the patient with antibiotics, thinking that it is not a true infection, still, you know, you need to put in the, uh, you know, contact precautions based precautions once you know that your patient is infected with a multi-drug resistant organism and also the burns unit here should have been educated so that they know how the transmission is taking place how is it uh, to be handled this specific uh, situation so the patient should be placed under contact precautions and should ideally be put in a single room with an attached toilet uh, the healthcare workers should wear um, appropriate uh, pp like gloves and uh, gowns and also try and use dedicated equipment. A lot of outbreaks have been reported where just mere sharing of things like, uh, you know, BP cuffs and uh, even uh, stethoscopes and other equipment led to outbreaks uh, in hospitals. So that is very important. Use dedicated equipment for these patients. And education, of course, is the most important. So till now, I have discussed the broad definition, the chain of transmission, modes of transmission, and uh, types of HAI, standard precautions, and transmission-based precautions. Now I'll be moving on to prevention of specific infections using the bundle approach. So what is a bundle? A care bundle identifies a set of key interventions uh, that have been derived from evidence-based guidelines. That means they have, there is evidence enough to show that if you use a set of uh, preventive measures together, uh, it will improve the outcomes in patients. So depending upon the type of uh, HAI, there are different uh, prevention bundles that have been recommended. Uh, supposedly, you're talking about the catheter-associated uh, UTI. So it has the insertion bundle and the management bundle. So for we know that, uh, you know, uh, catheter should only be inserted for a specific reason, don't just anybody admitted to the hospital into your ward should not be catheterized either, you know, for monitoring urinary output. If there is bladder outlet obstruction, then preventing contaminated of, you know, sacral wounds, terminal care. So there, there has to be a specific reason why uh, a catheter is inserted. There should be a competent healthcare worker to insert who knows the technique and who will maintain aseptic uh, uh, precautions and also We've been using this for many, many years, but closed system with the bag below the bladder is a norm which is to be used. Next, management uh, bundle, review for the catheter, you know, uh, daily, whether the patient needs it anymore or you simply need to remove it if, if it's not required. And this is true for any device uh, that is used in the patient. If you don't, uh, if you think that the device is no longer utilized, you it's better that you remove it because every single day, uh, you know, additional day that the device is there, the chances of infection, they increase. The um, bag should be emptied whenever three-fourths full and use a clean container for each patient. Secure the catheter to the, to the leg or lower urine samples from the sampling port only should be collected and not from the bag. And hand hygiene and PP should be worn before the patient is, uh, the catheter is handled. Coming to surgical site uh, infection prevention bundle. So this is again important things to remember here are that before surgery, the patient should generally shower or bathe um, with soap and water or with the antiseptic agent. Uh, avoid removing hair uh, from the operative site. Especially it's important to remember that razors should never be used because they cause micro abrasions, which, uh, you know, become a nidus for infection. And so I, either, you know, ideally it should not be removed. If at all hair have to be removed, uh, Appilators or hair removal creams are supposed to be better than cases. Give antimicrobial prophylaxis according to the local guidelines of your department or unit. Alcohol based or alcohol containing skin preparations should be used until unless contraindication. Generally, a chlorhexidine with alcohol is one of the most commonly used preparations. And maintain perioperative normothermia, increased fraction of uh, inspired oxygen, and also glycemic control, which will all lead to. Uh, lesser infection. Clapsy prevention bundle. This is a very busy slide, but there are a lot of components which need to be borne in mind whenever you have a central line associated bloodstream infection. So to prevent that, uh, we have an insertion bundle. So 
uh, it's very important to remember it should actually a uh, central line should be inserted with uh, as much uh, you know aseptic precautions as if performing an invasive surgery so maximally sterile barrier precautions should be uh, you know used skin cleaning using an alcohol based chlorhexidine uh, uh, is recommended evidence of femoral vein uh, for central vena access uh, is there you know either use a subclavian vein or a jugular vein dedicated staff should be there who know who know the technique how to insert and there should be availability of standard insertion packs and standard guidelines so that everything is is in place once somebody picks up the you know insertion pack they know that everything will bear will be there in the pack they don't have to run around while uh, you know inserting the central line and also nowadays i think this is more of a standard of care that ultrasound should be used for of the central line because then there is minimal fiddling around and tissue damage at the site so uh, lesser probability of uh, acquisition of infection by the patient so next we have the maintenance bundle so if how do you maintain a central line so again daily review if the patient requires a central line or not uh, whenever you are to manipulate uh, the central line uh, always before and after uh, you should scrub the hub which is known as scrub hub use an swab and clean the hub for 15 seconds let it dry for 15 seconds uh, before and after and that will make sure that there is no biofilm formation in the hub and that will decrease the central line associated infections Mm, there are recommendations for chlorhexidine washes also and changing of dresses there is no fixed uh, you know recommendation but it it's mostly your own unit's policy as to when the dressing or when you know a central line will be replaced so you follow your unit's policy as an appropriate uh, nurse to patient ratio in the icu so that proper care of the central line is taken by the nursing staff wrap prevention bundle you know elevation of the head end of the bed uh, uh, so that to prevent any aspiration and uh, use of sub subglottic uh, secretion uh, uh, or use of subglottic secretion drainage generally is done uh, oral uh, hygiene with chlorhexidine daily uh, sedative interruption and daily assessment of readiness to extubate uh, which is uh, true with other uh, devices as well all you know you have to Uh, every day assess whether the patient needs to be further intubated or not or he is ready to come out peptic ulcer disease prophylaxis deep vein thrombosis prophylaxis uh, they are part of the prevention bundle and also um, initiation of safe enteral nutrition within 24 to 48 hours of icu admission generally you know uh, you know enteral nutrition is uh, put in early on again same reason that uh, you know if you simply place the ng tube in the stomach it, there, there are again chances of aspiration so finally i'll be talking about uh, biomedical waste management and one thing which i think a lot of the time there is uh, you know probably there isn't much clarity that but the responsibility of segregation is with the generator of the biomedical waste this is so important to understand uh, residents can't do that you know they'll um perform dressing but uh, the gauge pieces are there they give medication but needle and syringe is open ones are just kept at the in the dressing trolley it is your responsibility to segregate to put them into appropriate bins so the, these are uh, as per the latest biomedical waste guidelines by the cpcb these were uh, you know they changed in 2016 and they've been And sorry, there have been two amendments uh, in 2018 and 19, and now we are using different types of bins. So you have uh, the yellow bin, the red bin, the blue bin, the transparent, uh, you know, uh, bin, black bin, and then the uh, blue and the the light blue and the green bin. So I'll just go through quickly of what is to be put in uh, which type of bin. So mm, the yellow bin. uh generally the anatomical waste chemical waste soil waste chemotherapy waste discarded linen medicines labor to be put into the yellow bin just a word of caution that uh, you know if you are dealing with infectious uh, waste like petri dishes blood bags etc they need to be pre treated as per the cpcb they need to be pre treated at source so in the hospital either by autoclaving or by using a microwave they need to be treated if you are regularly dealing with cytotoxic drugs 
so these have to be you know uh, put in a specific uh, you know yellow container I- ideally it should be a puncture proof yellow container with the cytotoxic uh, sign on it so that you know that these have to be put in anything coming in contact with cytotoxic drug be it uh, you know the ampule vial the needle syringe you know everything has to be put uh, into the cytotoxic waste bin and if you if you have a needle and syringe you just need to do the scoop method cap it and then put it into this it should not be the needle should not be put in you know without the cap on because again it will lead to the uh, injuries the red uh, bin they uh, are for contaminated uh, plastic waste and mostly these uh, anything put into the red bin uh, generally the aim is to that they will get recycled so the, you have uh, you know, tubings plastic bottles intravenous tubes catheters cannula syringe without the needle everything is to be put into the red bag uh, into the blue bin you put uh, glass waste and implants generally broken glass discarded vials bottles etc all can be put into the blue bin for metal sharps like uh, scalpel blades needles etc so all are put into this uh, puncture proof transparent container and the this this is uh, a new introduction which which is a black bag uh, or a black bin and it ha- it is it, it is labeled as hazardous and other waste so these are the non infectious but hazardous waste which is is usually include you know uh, used containers of disinfectants and pesticides used cfl bulbs tube lights lithium ion alkaline batteries so whatever hazardous material non infectious is being produced in the hospital is supposed to be put into the black bin with this sign hazardous waste and the general waste you know that uh, earlier we used to put everything into black but now this again has to be segregated so you have the light blue bin and the green bin so all biodegradable general waste goes into the green bin the gila kuda as we it is known as and uh, is go, goes into the uh, the recyclable waste goes into the blue bin so this is just you know in brief uh, how you are supposed to segregate but most importantly you are the one who is supposed to segregate anybody producing biomedical waste should segregate it it's not the duty of the nursing staff there it's not the duty of the uh you know safai karmachari so thank you so much thank you sir uh, now i'd like to request the audience to post their questions in the chat If anyone has any queries, please raise your hands or uh, post your queries in the chat. So, uh, would you like to ask any questions to the participants? so it will be difficult to gauge you know the uh, level of knowledge but i think anybody working in a clinical setup or in a hospital setup uh, should be very well aware of all of these especially as i told that whenever you are uh, you know interacting with the patient standard precautions should be followed and uh, you know long run you understand that you put in so much of an effort to save the beat the patient and because of healthcare associated infections you know the outcomes may not be very good so there are simple things which when put in place can really make a lot of difference if you look at data uh, you know uh, a lot of poor outcomes are because of hcis so i think i would request everybody who's listening that every patient you interact with the standard precaution should be in place so there is one question in the chat when should we change the foley's catheter is there some time prescribed so this is a very common question that is asked again there is no uh, you know fixed uh, cut off which is uh, defined it depends upon how the patient is doing if the as i said uh, you know the cotti bundle is being followed appropriately insertion and maintenance so they, it can go on for days together thank you sir 
Any other queries from anyone? Uh, Dr. Rakis Loda sir had message that routine change of catheters is not recommended. So if you, uh, if there is none, actually there is one more. Uh, in some national level training, it was told that it should be after seven days. At least I'm, you know, I'm not aware of any such recommendation. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, giving us your valuable time. Uh, this uh, uh, session will also be available in the YouTube, in the NAMS uh, YouTube channel. And hence, it will be very helpful for the residents to go through it again. And uh, thank you so much, sir, once again. Thank you. It's a valuable time. Now, I would like to invite the speaker for the next session, Professor Rakis Loda, sir, who is a professor in the Department of Pediatrics at Ames, New Delhi. His areas of interest include pediatric intensive care, pulmonology, and infectious diseases. He has received multiple research grants, has uh, written multiple publications in peer-reviewed journals. He is the editor of Indian Journal of Pediatrics and also an associate editor in Indian Pediatrics. It's a honor and a privilege to have you with us here, sir. And uh, sir is going to talk to us about the patient safety protocols. Over to you, sir. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, my, my slides are visible, right? Yes, sir. It's not in full screen. Uh, it's not now. Okay, so over next uh, uh, 20, about 40 minutes or so, we're going to talk about patient safety uh, protocols. And I thank uh, NAMS uh, and the organizing team for this opportunity to uh, you know, talk on this topic. Uh, and I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, our residents, Dr. Sharan, Kritika, and Vasuda, uh, for you know, their inputs uh, for when we talk about the patient safety protocols. So uh, as an outline, I would just be talking about burden of unsafe care, uh, defining what unsafe care is, common sources of unsafe care, and how do we improve? And importantly, what's the role of the uh, PG's uh, residents in improving patient safety? And also touch upon a bit about challenges, because if we know them, then we may be able to better address them. Uh, and I would encourage the, the the participants to maybe put in their comments in the chat uh, in between and uh, with, you know while we discuss the case, and it can take them up. So I'll start with the uh, uh, you know this is something or uh, something similar uh, may may be may have happened uh, in, in in the or slightly different scenarios may have happened. So I'll just read through this. Uh, at 7 p.m. evening, a new patient has just reached the high-dependency unit. Uh, the patient is a case of heaving sarcoma, post-chemotherapy, uh, is in septic shock and has been intubated for the same. And uh, your senior resident is busy stabilizing two other sick patients. So as part of uh, what you know about septic shock, you decide to place uh, central line and start times. Uh, you are concerned uh, that you know the patient will destabilize because you have only uh, 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 one peripheral cannula and uh, you kind of just run over the list of prerequisites in your head, platelets are normal, child is NTO, uh, you sedate and you insert a femoral line. Now, the residents have not been very familiar with putting in, in a guided line and it takes about three, four attempts, but finally the line is placed in the femoral vein. Uh, at the end of the shift, the therapeutic endpoints of shock are achieved and the night team arrives to take over. You have written on a meticulous so hand over to the night junior resident and you have some other reports to collect. So you continue to work and your senior residents have the bedside round. You leave, you're, you're tired, satisfied. And I think uh, that's pretty much uh, a story where for most senior res residents of most residents, irrespective of the departments that they work in. At about 12 midnight, the night duty junior resident noticed that the patient has developed tachycardia. Had stabilized initially, but now has tachycardia. Checks the input output and notices that the patient is not catheterized. There is a palpable bladder and he 
me a police catheter and Frank's blood pours into the urine bag. A uh, Strauser sample for urgent CBC hemoglobin has dropped from 8 to 6 gram per DL over a short period of time. Flips through the file, notices that the child has received diphosphamide a week back. Could it be hemorrhagic cystitis? Start for hydration and blood irrigation. And it's about 2 p.m. before, you know, the abdominal distension is noticed. So there's a, about, uh, let's say, six, seven hours after the blind was uh, inserted. Now, subsequently, the thing revealed that contrast was leaking into the peritoneum. The bladder was injured during the line uh, insertion. Uh, the night over that the initial resident had written and handed over at 8 p.m. read that plan insert foley's for input output charting. Uh, the over was pinned to the blackboard and forgotten in the chaos. So what went wrong? Let's look at it. Can we have some responses quickly if people are uh, willing to just either unmute and speak out, uh, let's type it out in the chat. We'll wait for a few seconds before any responses? Uh, am I audible? I have a comment that the voice is low. Sir, uh, you're audible. Okay, so maybe I think the person could just, uh, you know, pop the speaker volume, I guess. Okay, so we don't have comments. I think we'll, we'll just go go ahead. And uh, so let's... So again, if you look at, I'll just highlight the components which could have contributed. So uh, you kind of quickly run over a list of prerequisites in your head, right? You know, you just think through, you look at a few things and you kind of think that things are okay to go ahead. Uh, unfamiliar with putting in a guided line. Uh, you have written out a meticulous over which you hand over to the night junior resident. On the other hand, you know, a lot of things are happening with the with the senior resident. Uh, there was a plan to insert a police and this over is pinned on the, the blackboard and forgotten in the chaos. So with this, the question that, that are hospitals dangerous places? And uh, 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 this is something that we need to need to be asking ourselves as to do the incidents like these happen. They may not be happening frequently, but, uh, you know, these things happen. So do they make hospitals a dangerous place? Let's look at some some data. So patient safety is a, a serious global public health concern. And uh, I think very often uh, the comparisons made with the aviation industry because uh, uh, you know, it's uh, you're, you're flying up in the air, and uh, anything going wrong, uh, there's a high chance of uh, you know, uh, 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 and a fatality. And if you look at it currently, for comparison, there's a one in a million chance of a person being harmed while traveling by aeroplane, which is possibly many fold lower than transport by any other means. On the other side, if we compare, there is a one in 300 chance of a patient being harmed during the healthcare. And very often industries that are perceived to have higher risks, such as aviation, nuclear industries, have much better safety record than healthcare. Obviously, you know, these are different kind of scenarios. Uh, every patient's different. And we may always say that, uh, you know, uh, 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 the other side, you're talking about equipment or uh, even if it's high tech, uh, uh, you know, uh, equipment and aeroplanes or whatever other things are, the other hand, patients are a different thing. But anyway, this is uh, for the sake of comparison and also for us to understand that uh, there is a, a significant risk of patients being harmed during healthcare. In terms of the burden of diseases, globally, people have estimated that patient harm is the 14th leading cause of global disease burden, comparable to diseases such as tuberculosis and malaria. A lot of data that I'm talking about comes from the WHO uh, Patient Safety Initiative, uh, their, their documents for that. And the harm can range from a range of incidents or adverse events with nearly, uh, you know, uh, uh, can uh, uh, about 50% of them being preventable. And 
transparency and preventability of adverse events across you know multiple low and middle income countries the rate of adverse events was about 8% almost 83% could have been prevented and 30% could lead to death and if we see globally overall two thirds of all adverse events actually occur in the low middle income countries so which anyway we are saying low resource and on top of that if you have deal with adverse events which have kind of warrant uh, you know more resources so it's it's kind of uh, uh, a double hit or double injury kind of a situation about 1 in 10 patients in hic and about 1 in 4 or 1 in 3 may get harmed during healthcare so this is mainly inpatient data uh, 30, 134 million, that's about 13.4 13, 13 crore adverse events are reported annually due to unsafe care in hospitals. Uh, 2.6 million deaths occur annually due to unsafe care. So obviously there, this is a huge burden. And amongst these, the unsafe medication practices and er errors are leading causes of avoidable harm in healthcare. And uh, this does have impact on the global economic growth as well. Now, what are the common sources of patient harm? So I think amongst the common ones are medical errors, medication errors, uh, surgeries. So we just had a, a comprehensive talk on healthcare associated infections, uh, diagnostic errors, patient falls, uh, venous thromboembolism in patients, uh, and there would be certain high-risk patients, pressure ulcers. Uh, unsafe transfusion practices, unsafe injections. So unsafe injections could also be part of, you know, medical uh, errors and also contribute to the healthcare associated infections. And something which may find odd, but, you know, patient misidentification still does happen. Not common, but it does happen. Now let's look at some of the important ones in a little bit more of detail to understand. So medical errors are common, may be affecting up to one in every 30 patients in healthcare. And about 25% of these could be severe or life-threatening. And overall, half of the avoidable harm in healthcare is related to medications. Uh, of these, there could be multiple ways. So we may write wrong doses or, you know, uh, they're during administration, there are issues and incorrect doses, either less or more are given. Something that has to be given as an infusion is given as a push dose and so on. So these are kind of call administrative errors. And if you look at the literature overall about in primary care, uh, these kind of occur five to 80 times per 100,000 consultations. There could be those that are associated with systems and process of delivering care. And these are the most frequently reported cares, uh, uh, types of errors in the, uh, the primary care. Uh, moving on to surgery, so I think more than the 300 million the surgical procedures are performed every year. And despite the awareness of what is adverse effects, surgical errors continue to occur at high rate. 10% uh, of all preventable patient harm in healthcare uh, is estimated to be due to, you know, happening in the surgical settings. Uh, again, estimates of uh, nearly a million patients may be dying annually from surgical globally and most of the the adverse events occur pre or post surgery it could be perioperative it could be anesthetic related mortality and again these rates are two to three times higher in the uh, lmic's than in the uh, high income countries i i won't talk much about the healthcare associated infections dr gagan has dealt with this in detail and just to summarize that these result in uh, prolonged stay, disability, increased costs for to the patients, health systems, and uh, definitely uh, also avoidable deaths. Uh, diagnostic error is something that would be cutting across all clinical specialties, and uh, inaccurate or delayed diagnosis, uh, you know, uh, affect all settings of care and harm an unacceptable number of patients. Uh, these may occur in 5 to 20 percent of physician patient uh, interactions or encounters, and uh, harmful diagnostic errors were found in about 0.7 uh, percent of adult ad uh, admissions. And if you kind of look at kind of generalized this data, most of us are going to suffer once in our lifetimes. Uh, another thing which is important and which we have to keep in mind is. Uh, patient falls, and these two happen. We are talking about what happens in the hospital and not what's happening at home. Uh, the rate of occurrence is about three to five per thousand bed days, 
and uh, more than one third of these incidents could result in uh, injury and some of them could be uh, severe. So definitely, again, these affect the clinical outcomes and increase the financial burden on the systems. Now, if we just look at and try and understand but compare it with aviation industry of uh, the nuclear power industry and so on i think we need to understand that uh, 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 healthcare uh, health systems operate in, in an increasingly complex environment there are new treatments technologies care models so while there is a therapeutic potential so we are obviously treating more sick patients we are getting successful outcomes uh, but uh, these could also pose new threats to safe care and I think we need to understand that uh, a, a patient seeks healthcare to us for getting better. Uh, if instead there's something that actually worsens the condition or gets the patient a new condition, uh, that is certainly not going to be acceptable to anybody. And therefore, patient safety is not recognized as a fundamental principle of uh, healthcare. And people are recognizing it globally and it's seen as a, a global public health challenge. And every point in the process of caregiving contains a certain degree of inherent unsafety. Global efforts to reduce the burden of patient harm. And they unfortunately, you know, they may not have changed substantially over the last 15 years, despite pioneering work in some healthcare settings. So some things may work in a setting but uh, we haven't been able to get benefits out of it across the you know different healthcare settings across the world. And when I talk about this, this is uh, true for the high income country setting and also the low and middle income country uh, setting. So what is, if you have to define, so the WHO defines it as a framework of organized activities that creates cultures, processes, procedures, behaviors, technologies, and environments in healthcare that are consist that consistently and sustainably lower risks, reduce the occurrence of avoidable harm, make error less likely, and if it does occur, it reduces the impact. So, you know, it, it's, it's overall, it's a framework of organized activities. It's not about an individual alone, we'll look at what the contribution or the role of individuals would be, but a whole lot of it is around systems, around cultures, procedures, and uh, uh, of which we all are a part of. Now, again, Institute of Medicine, uh, you know, they defined it as prevention of harm to patients. Uh, the Agency for Healthcare Related Research and Quality uh, uh, defines it as freedom from accidental or preventable injuries produced by medical care. So again, if you look at overall different definitions, I think finally, uh, uh, while definitions are important, I think we need to understand the, the gist of it. And we are focusing on the preventable errors. So we need to learn. And this system of care delivery should be built on a culture of safety, which involves healthcare professionals, organizations, and patients. So I think everybody has heard about this uh, uh, primary non uh, no say uh, essentially first do no harm. I think that's something very simple. When patients come in to get better, uh, certainly should not get harmed during the process. And therefore, patient safety practices have been defined as those that reduce the, the risk of uh, uh, adverse events related to exposure to medical care across a range of diagnosis and conditions and across, you know, different healthcare uh, uh, settings that, that would be there. So what causes errors, right? I, I defined the, the patient safety and a whole lot of it is, uh, when we talk about a framework, we're talking about systems framework, but still whenever there's an error, uh, people would be talking about, you know, focusing on people versus focusing on systems. So let's just look at these. So people-based approach and uh, somebody may just think bad things happen to bad people. And if your patient crashes because of a medical error you made, it probably means it would be, it would, it would, you know, people are going to interpret that, you know, you just don't care enough. You know, they're not, they wouldn't be seeing that you worked hard, you spent 12 hours on the floor, you didn't take a break, you didn't have food or whatever. Uh, if an error happens, you know, it just, uh, people may be out there to blame you. 
and uh, people they may tend to believe it as that errors are uh, as, as a moral kind of an issue and it's like you know uh, everybody should be perfect and uh, none of the errors are acceptable so that's kind of one view and we look at it by by the this kind of a view on the other hand if you look at systems based approach uh, i think uh, the 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 uh, premise is that uh, humans are fallible and errors are to be expected even with the best of people and best organizations and uh, the developer of the swiss cheese model kind of mentioned that the most important distinguishing feature of high reliability organizations is their collective preoccupation with the possibility of failure uh, they expect to make errors and train their workforce to recognize and recover them so if there is something going potential errors and so on uh, they the bad uh, ones could actually be caught at one of these three layers some may still creep through but you know majority will be able to to stop so that's a systems based approach now what we need to look at it is these are not if you think that these happen once in a while i think the data that we saw uh, doesn't seem to suggest so uh, there's something you could talk about the everydayness of uh, errors of uh, you know healthcare services are complex and when these complex factors interact uh, they could be harmful and unanticipated outcomes errors that could actually and organizational factors have been considered the blunt end or the majority and they represent the majority of errors and clinicians are kind of considered the sharp end uh, uh, they may be focused on this but actually a lot of things are, happen because of organizational factors in which the clinicians are are practicing or or or, or operating therefore to prevent errors the organizations in which humans work uh, need to be adapted to their cognitive strengths and weakness be designed to ameliorate the effects of whatever human error occurs uh we can say a large part of mental functioning is automatic rap rapid and effortless and obviously it's it's kind of uh uh, uh comes with training and why is this automatic uh, uh thinking possible because we have an array of mental models uh that are expert on some minuscule recurrent aspect of our lives like you know it's as simple as going to work or as simple as you know collecting a blood sample for arranging uh, a blood product for a patient who's going for a surgery uh, uh, and so on and so over a period we do develop the schema to respond to emergencies to respond to uh, various clinical findings and uh, many of the errors actually occur from flaws in thinking that affect the decision making and i think i'm just highlighting this point because uh, this is something that during our training we need to learn many things and if we learn them well then the chances of you know going wrong would would go down now <clears throat> when we are providing clinical care uh, we as clinicians we are expected to make logical and accurate decisions all the time and this ability which influences the patient safety it's associated with you know multiple factors uh obviously there is a knowledge base so uh, uh, which would be there uh, which can be uh, uh recall as well as our ability to respond to conditions which we haven't seen previously uh, there could be systems related fact factors distractions and interruptions so a lot of time you may be spending on mundane work which is not directly contributing to patient care and, and every now on distracted Uh, it's dependent on availability of essential information which may mean that your clinical history exam is good uh, uh, you have access to the data you have access to the lab reports in time and very importantly the workload uh, this is something that we can all complain about that you know we are always overworked there are too many patients uh, too few residents too few other staff and uh, uh, that's something that would definitely interfere with uh, the decision making and then there are barriers to innovation in trying to uh, look at or solve new problems and the effects of these factors of all the increasingly complex nature of clinicians roles and responsibilities so very often the clinician's role is not just about the clinical medicine there are a whole lot of other aspects there could be certain medical legal aspects there could be related to administration 
uh, arranging for medications, arranging for devices, and so on. And it's also complicated by the complex nature of, of preventing errors uh, from harming the patients. And finally, it's dependent on availability of resource. So if for a certain treatment, you need certain set of medications, procedures, or investigations, if these are not available, there's likelihood that your diagnosis may not be accurate and therefore the treatment may not be accurate. Now, broadly, if you look at uh, as clinicians, and that's true for any profession, the performance of humans and their problem-solving abilities could be categorized as skill-based, rule-based, or knowledge-based. So the skill base is basically a, a, a pattern of thought and actions that are governed by previously stored patterns, pre-programmed instructions, and th those that could be performed in a subconscious really not, don't have to think through. And many of the things that we do, uh, what kind of uh, the skills are going to you know, practice and uh, doing it correctly over a period of time would make us more skilled. Uh, they could be rule-based, so they could be solutions to familiar problems that are governed by rules and preconditions. Uh, they could be knowledge-based, so we use when new conditions are encountered. And this requires conscious analytical processing based on the stored knowledge. Now, the issue is that when errors occur, the so-called deficiencies of healthcare providers, example, sufficient training, inadequate experience, and opportunities to circumvent rules are manifested as mistakes, violations, and incompetence. So one would be our own. If our training is insufficient, we haven't received adequate training, uh, we are not experienced. So obviously, we haven't seen all kinds of problems. Uh, all varieties of problem, uh, different severities. And in addition, if there are so-called opportunities or the systems allow to circumvent the rules, uh, uh, they would be manifestations of, and these would be appearing as mistakes, violence, and uh, violations, and incompetence. Now, what are the factors? Mean? So again, now I'm talking about uh, the individuals. Now, it could be residents, it could be nurses, it could be the other healthcare professionals. Uh, one is the lack of knowledge of protocols. So there are certain patient safety protocols, checklists, and so on. So there would be something to put in a central line, something to insert a police catheter. Uh, there would be something, how to manage a patient with septic shock, how to manage a patient who has had a fall from height, who comes in with a road trauma, uh, um, a pregnant woman who has uh, uh, unusual symptoms or prolonged labor. So you need to be aware about protocols. The second part is even just knowing is not enough. Uh, we need to adhere to these protocols. And that's another issue, you know, in terms of uh, uh, if we know that we need to do certain things, a simple example, again, drawing upon from the previous talk that if you know that uh, the hand hygiene has to be added to, to prevent healthcare-associated infections. Uh, we don't kind of adhere to the protocol. We don't wash up properly. We don't do it at uh, all the times. Then despite having knowledge, knowledge is going to lead to a situation for, uh, uh, for harm. The other aspect is lack of uh, good teamwork. So the healthcare delivery is complex and one would need to draw upon uh, of all the, the staff and a lot of uh, non-physician staff are there. You could have nurses, techni technicians, uh, the lab uh, uh, people, and so on. And often there is uh, suboptimal involvement of these staff. Uh, the training may be also an issue. Uh, and then there is inadequate communication amongst these. So that this is something that that would be you know responsible. So you, you may want to prescribe, but if the communication with the nursing staff is not adequate, uh, there may be delays in administration of the treatment. Uh, the other thing which happens is there's limited involvement of residents in non-clinical aspects of healthcare, and uh, they're not used to, and when they kind of, as they grow, go up the ladder, uh, there are many things that they haven't learned about, and that again affects efficiency. Uh, this phrase I, I found, you know, maybe from one of our uh, 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 residents as to if people start thinking that end of shift responsibility, my job is over, uh, that's something that could be affecting the patient safety. So the other aspects are uh, 
very often we believe and many of us may be working in setups which are not heavily resourced uh, and when i say resource it's not just the uh, equipment part or uh, facilities part uh, it's also about the manpower and uh, the belief that you know uh, if the there is a low cost or a low resource setting of uh, the care cannot not be of high quality i think that we need to be uh, careful about because certain minimum level of patient safety has to be ensured at all levels, all types of care, uh, irrespective of the cost. Uh, it doesn't mean that if you're uh, working in a in a, uh, a corporate hospital, which is a five star, seven star kind of a facility, everything's going to be great there. And something which is a public hospital, uh, things are going to be bad. I don't think so. It works like that. We would have to put in patient safety uh, mechanisms at all these places. The other issues which kind of interfere with the audits uh, and learning from errors is just we stick to the old systems which are paper-based and there's lack of digitization. So again, if you look at uh, the, the, the patient safety action plan, I think globally people have started talking about uh, there are multiple components uh, wherein there could be policies, high reliability systems, safety of clinical processes, uh, engaging the patient and the fa family, educating the healthcare workers, uh, you know, their skills and safety, uh, information, research and risk management, and finally, synergy, partnership, and solidarity. And then you're essentially having all of these uh, the data to learn. Uh, there's a safety culture. We can build it up into uh, evidence-based uh, action uh, plan and policies, and the scientific expertise and uh, patient experience. So finally, you know, overall mission and goal is to improve the patient safety. And this, apart from, you know, the healthcare workers, to involve the governments, policymakers, and you know, globally, World Health Organization kind of puts many of these things together. Uh, uh, and the vision is that you know, when they, when, that you have to have a world in which no one is harmed in healthcare, and every patient receives safe and respectful care every time and every year. So, be it a primary health center or a dispensary, to a tertiary or a quaternary level uh, uh, facility. And again, these are some of the international uh, patient safety uh, the, uh, uh, which are there. Uh, and again, you can see some of these seem to be very simple. You know, identify patients correctly. You know, kind of just having a tag or, or some kind of an identifier, improving effective communication between healthcare workers, uh, improving the safety of high alert medications, uh, safe surgeries, healthcare associated infections to be reduced. Uh, and again, you know, you could have specific uh, 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 targets like improving hand hygiene and uh, uh, reducing the risk of patient harm resulting from falls. And there could be specific tools for all of these. So obviously we need to have uh, this as a systems issue. Uh, patient safety has to be an institutional goal. Uh, we need to report errors. We need to audit. Uh, we need electronic health records, software to assist prescriptions. Uh, we need to periodically to review the protocols and checklists and update them based on the current knowledge and uh, uh, what we are practicing. And we need to review systems regularly. I think uh, they could be, uh, you need to remove the redundancies, improve efficiency. And there has to be a multidisciplinary team uh, to oversee patient safety initiatives. So also ask that as a resident or a physician, been a part of larger system. So we can't always blame everything on the system. Uh, what can we do to improve patient safety? So this is one paper which kind of looked at residents' perspectives on patient safety in university and uh, 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 teaching hospitals in the United States, uh, uh, different uh, areas. So there were multiple issues identified, like lack of information, volume and accuracy of the patients, inadequate supervision, lack of communication, transition of care, time constraint, technology interface issues, and the workflow. And if we look at uh, these are areas that we can work on, you know, lack of information or knowledge of, about conditions, uh, inadequate supervision, lack of communication, transition of care. This is something that uh, uh, we can possibly control and improve. <laughs> Uh, volume and equity issues, we can't control that. This is what depends on, you know, the, the whatever's happening in the population, same things too for time constraints and a few other systems related issues. So let's just look back at the case that's wrong. 
So lack of information. So one is that when you're performing any new procedure and you're not really, or you want to do anything or learn anything new, uh, you need to be sure that whether, whether you are aware of all possible complications and precautions. Similarly, when charting a new medication, what do you know about the drug administration and its side effects? And checklists are something that are designed to reduce this cognitive uh, cognitive burden. And whenever performing any intervention for which a checklist exists, we need to use it. So it's not that you need to have an idea, but while you're doing a procedure, there has to be another person who needs to make sure that you're adhering to the checklist. And that's a femoral line checklist uh, may have an alert you to place a police before you put in a femoral line, for example. Uh, inadequate supervision. So it's always, it's, it's I think, uh, whenever in doubt, ask for help. Involving a second level of supervision in kind of helps activate your own Swiss cheese model. So you have now instead of one person, you have two persons, and that could help reduce. So you need that uh, inadequate supervision. And in settings like these, uh, asking for help is not a sign of uh, incompetence. It's not a sign of weakness. It's not a sign of lack of uh, I think that's something that we need to keep in mind. <clears throat> Then the other aspect is inadequate communication and transition of care and uh, the handover has to be given as well as taken. So, you know, the accepting team also has to look at it. It's not that we just hand over a well-written note to the team. Uh, I think everything has to be discussed and they have to be owning up. At the times uh, when the patient has been transitioned from one level of care or one facility to other, uh, you need to ensure that patient details are conveyed and they are understood by the team that is taking over. So here we can see there were multiple areas uh, where things didn't go as expected, and but uh, but but many of these, if we had followed the systems, could have been taken care of. So again, frameworks for different things like medication without harm, key action areas uh, relate to you know patients and public, what they need to do, what the healthcare professionals need to do. And uh, what are the issues around medicines, uh, systems, and back of medications? Uh, there could be different aspects. You know, how do we handle these? Uh, the medication choice, uh, avoiding polypharmacy, looking at the dose if required, modify for renal and hepatic dysfunction, uh, proper route, frequency, compatible solution, uh, final concentration, asepsis during preparation. Uh, anticipated adverse events and you need to know about alternatives to if there are any serious adverse events and a complete prescription at discharge OPD visit uh, in terms of the tablets, liquids and so on. And we could again, there are multiple things like patient factors, human factors and system factors. Uh, patient factors are uh, would be related, you know, we need to a good interdepartmental co co coordination, effective communication by physician, uh, need to discontinue medications that are not required, prescription and eligible handwriting, uh, maintenance of patient diary or pill count or medication count, uh, education of physician amongst the human factors, uh, checklists, double checking, and a few other aspects which revolve around reportings and audits uh, to improve the, you know, or reduce the risk of medication errors. Another example that I take is uh, blood transfusion errors. And uh, 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 currently, the way the, the blood transfusion science has uh, kind of progressed, uh, most adverse effect events in, the, in relation to transfusions are caused by human errors. And one in every 19,000 units of red blood cells were transfused to a wrong patient uh, each year. I mean, this is some data. This is way back, but it does happen. And we can say, again, the system our systems are complex, uh, right from the request for uh, the arranging blood, taking sample, labeling it, receiving, testing, selection of component, labeling, uh, component collection, uh, you know, prescription, and finally the administration. And so there are certain things, these are components which are important in the lab. On the other hand, sample taking and administration with positive patient identification is uh, where it's important. Uh, this, these are the important components where errors could be happening. So there could be a uh, wrong blood in tube, uh, there may be insufficient sample, wrong indication, wrong patient request. Uh, in the blood bank, there could be errors in labeling, sample errors in testing, 
uh, incorrect uh, unit issuing, inappropriate storage, inappropriate uh, sample handling, wrong unit selection. And during transfusion, I think as uh, I just mentioned, wrong patient, wrong dose, wrong temperature of blood product, uh, kept outside too long, or, or very narrow catheter use. You know, if you use a, uh, let's say, in small babies, newborns, you have no option but to sm use small catheters. But if you start using these in older individuals, where the transfusion rate or the rate of infusion is transfusion is going to be high, uh, this is going to cause problems. So again, there is a SOP, which let's say, this is an example from the Department of Transfusion Medicine at Ames. And uh, this kind of just, uh, you need to look at it uh, in terms of, and they highlight what are the key things. For example, use two identifiers, one of them, the uh, uh, unique uh, health uh, care uh, facility identity, to identify the patient, uh, uh, immediately collect blood sample in tube, write patient name and UI site itself, cross-check with the requisition, rather than collecting a sample, going to a nursing counter and then trying to label. And never store a sample for cross-match for possible need for future transfusion. It has to be done at that same time. Uh, uh, owning it up, putting your signature and date of collection uh, of uh, the sample tube and signing on the request form. And uh, uh, take cross-match sample of only one patient at a time, complete all the paperwork, complete if it's online, complete that to the sample, the labeling of the sample before you move on to the next one. Now, checklists are, we believe, and uh, uh, it does, that's true, that currently hospitals do most of the right things on most patients and most of the time. However, we said that, you know, uh, this needs improvement because there's still a fair burden of unsafe care. And therefore, the checklist helps us to do all the right things on all patients and at all the times. Uh, there are multiple advantages. These checklists are supported by evidence. We can customize to our needs and settings. Uh, these have been evaluated in diverse uh, 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 settings across the world, and therefore, there, this is evidence-based, and it promotes adherence patient uh, or safety practices and it, most of them are simple you don't need many you just need minimal resources to implement something which has far-reaching safety intervention so let's look at this one of such tools uh, which is the surgical safety checklist of the who uh, kind of deals with three components before induction of anesthesia before skin incision and before the patient leaves the operating room and you kind of look at it we could expand this further so again, I think I won't really go into the details, but again, three components before induction of and of uh, uh, so you have essentially this is related to the nurse anesthetist uh, before skin incision uh, and uh, you have before the patient leaves operating room and again, different people who are involved and uh, this kind of takes care of most of the uh, pre and period complications. Now, if you just look at uh, uh, the residents' perspective, I, I, I guess you know most of uh, you would be saying uh, uh, this that the volume in active patients is proportion to the manpower, and therefore you know you're doing too many things, you're multitasking, doing so many things with time constraints uh, that errors do happen. And then you have other related issues like equipment and technology, and uh, we may lack either optimum equipment or we are not aware about uh, how they function and how we can rectify these. Uh, this happens, so you may have a ventilator running on a, on a patient, and if you're not aware about basic troubleshooting, there may be trouble. Uh, the other is related about the, it's about the workflow. Uh, a lot of time and energy is uh, diverted in redundant tasks, and therefore, uh, there would be a, a greater chance of errors. And then there is checklist fatigue. So you may have a checklist, but uh, a great degree of force or uh, is often required to make sure that the checklist system is followed. Very often you would find checklists which are just ticked. Uh, the, the actual purpose of them assisting in the procedure is not really, the, not really followed. So... Uh, I think I'd like, just like to sum up uh, that healthcare is complex. Uh, uh, there's a fair likelihood of harm that happens in healthcare settings, and uh, this has to be reduced. Uh, we need to allow systems and individuals in patient safety efforts, and certainly, you know, systems, uh, the improvement in this is uh, something 
uh, that that has to be done. Uh, but at the same time, I think we need to understand the role of individuals within these systems. And I think during training, one of the key things that we could do is acquire adequate knowledge, skills, and obviously, and importantly, the attitude uh, uh, towards the patient-related issues. And finally, I think we need to follow the protocols and the and and, and the uh, checklist if you want to ensure uh, patient. Uh, uh, so you may have just as an example means again a lay layman example that you may be uh, people are asked to put on helmets uh, while driving two wheel two uh, wheeler vehicles, uh, use seat belts in a car. Uh, there are protocols. There are you know fines and everything. And yet, uh, they, 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 some people adhere for whatever reason, be it, you know, fear of having a, a, a fine versus, you know, uh, that they actually believe that this is something that's important for their safety. But at the end of the day, I think we need to follow protocols. If we understand and uh, uh, understand the rationale, uh, that's always going to be better rather than somebody imposing uh, or, you know, having punitive action if these are not followed. So with this, I like to end. And again, uh, 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 this is a combined kind of a, when we talk about uh, patient safety per day, which was celebrated last month, uh, it's kind of uh, involving uh, the patients and their families and multiple com uh, kind of things. So uh, healthcare part is not just the healthcare workers. It's also involves the patients, their families, and therefore there have to be a, 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 a team effort which has to be done. So with this, I thank you for your patient listening and uh, uh, we could have a few questions and comments. Thank you. So maybe thank I'll you. stop uh, screen sharing and uh, we, we, could, uh, we could, yeah. Thank you very much, sir. I would now like to request the participants to either pose your questions in chat or raise their hands. So till that time, would you like to ask uh, any questions to the participants? Yeah, no, I just want to ask me. So I think I just described how many of, you know, you means it's not again, as I said, that if errors could happen, but uh, have you encountered situations where you have seen that, uh, you know, patient's care been affected due to uh, some reasons or what you have encountered or complications uh, which are potentially preventable? But anybody would be interested in narrating their uh, experience or their thoughts on the entire story about patient safety. You know, I tried to look at and I did try to present both these sides. One is what we we require within health systems. What should be happening? I also tried to highlight a few challenges that the the physicians, the residents uh, may be facing. So. Uh, you could talk about either of these aspects. Till the residents uh, come out with any questions. So one major challenge, as you highlighted, is the enormous workload which is faced by the residents. Uh, so because of which they feel that there is a lack of time uh, or less time to manage everything at once. So for example, in emergency settings, uh, it is most common, more commonly uh, like um, seen that uh, a resident will have to see multiple patients at a time. In those cases, uh, like what will be your suggestion to handle those uh, yeah but i think mean, what we need to realize is that we need to we need to first accept that patient safety is something that as a principle has to be done and as i said right you know it's not just individual dependent it has to be systems dependent so within a system uh, uh we could certainly have a scope for improvement and i think one of the key things is uh that means during the training period adequate exposure have adequate knowledge base they have adequate you know skill development and that's what you can do. Obviously, you know, let's say if if there are 
100 patients in a ward which is has only 40 beds and so on and your staff allocation is for those 40 beds and you have two to three times that happening all the time obviously there's going to be a compromise on the care and that's something that the the administration or the policy makers uh, actually have to handle if we are really seriously interested in improving the quality of care and uh, the patient safety from the residents perspectives i think we we would still focus on on let's say the the adequate knowledge and skill gaining during the training uh, and learning i'll just give you a simple example i think uh, uh, Dr. Gagan had also kind of highlighted, let's say, about importance of hand hygiene, uh, adhering to personal protective equipment, standard precautions, and so on and so forth. And uh, there are issues about adherence. Uh, but when we had COVID, I think there was immediately a, 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 a kind of a moment in adherence to all of these. Uh, now, whether it was fear of be getting infected and having an adverse outcome that drove it, uh, you know, that could be a very simple reason. Or we understood that we need to do it. So I think we need to kind of understand the importance of some of these. And again, as I said, in the entire scheme of things, uh, 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 residents are contributing a, a great deal to patient care. They are part of a system. And within that, each to do his or her best. If the systems were supporting them, then obviously the outcomes are going to be better. So uh, uh, the patient safety part, uh, overall, it's more about systems, cultures, but we have individuals who would be would be there. So I just try to focus on what the contribution or the role of individuals would be. But then I think on many of the things we need to be focusing more on the more on the systems. the queries by uh, any of the participants? Okay, I think maybe I guess the online uh, uh, sessions does bring in this challenge of, you know, somehow encouraging the interactions. Uh, uh, but I guess uh, that that's how it, it is. So I think we'll we'll take it uh, take it from here, and uh, maybe Dr. Priti, if there are no further queries or questions, then maybe I'll hand it over back to you. And thank you once again for the opportunity to talk about uh, this topic. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, taking out your valuable time and uh, coming uh, for uh, coming and teaching the residents. So again, this uh, session will be online uh, in the NAMS YouTube channel. So it will be helpful for all the residents. And also the video recording will be available in the NAMS website. So all the registered participants will be able to uh, see the recording whenever they want. Uh, so if those residents who could not join because of their clinical commitments, they will be able to see the scene. Uh, and I would also encourage all the residents and uh, everyone who has joined this meeting to encourage their postgraduate students to join this Navigate Medical CME program, which is uh, a joint program by AIMS and NAMS. And it is occurring on the first Friday of every month from 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, so once again, I thank each and everyone. I would like to thank Professor uh, Sivsarin sir and the Umesh Kapil sir. Uh, it is a, a dream uh, project of both of them. And it has been going on uh, very well since the start of January. I would like to place on record the contribution by Professor Ajay Kumar Sud, sir, who is the Deputy Secretary of the National Academy of Medical Sciences. I would like to thank the speakers for today's sessions, Prof. Dr. Gagandeep, sir, and Professor Rakesh Luda, sir, who had taken out their valuable time from their busy schedule and have uh, come here to contribute for, the, uh, for improving the knowledge and skills of the residents. I'd like to thank all the participants, all the audience who have taken out their time and joined this session. I'd also like to thank the IT team of National Academy of Medical Sciences, uh, Anil ji and Ravi ji, who had been a great help in uh, organizing the sessions and also for the technical support. I'd like to thank each and every one of you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, with this, I would like to conclude today's session. Thank you.